life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. This is a practical, something you don't necessarily uh, generally see combined with Bible study, the word practical. <laughs> Amen. It is a practical guide to life, relationships, and love. Amen. And I say practical because uh, its applications are every day. The applications uh, in the areas that we're looking at, the things we're looking at, we're looking at them at a very practical level. I've said before, the church traditionally has the habit of uh, presenting everything, the, from my perspective anyway, the way I see it, they're always presenting things from the perspective of uh, ideals. Ideally, you know, everything. Boy, families would be perfect. Every father would be a perfect father. Every mother would be a perfect mother. Every child would be a perfect child. Every marriage would be a perfect marriage. The only problem with that is that's not the real world. And the truth of the matter is that if you really had an opportunity to go into every home of every church member and every couple and every, you'd probably find out that there isn't a single soul there that's living up to that perfect ideal. You know, we've got a party in America and politics that loves to uh, tout. I, I want to figure out how to say this. They're always touting, you know. Uh, well, but there should be this and there should be that. Well, there should be a lot of things. But in the world world, in the real world, there isn't. And you've got to deal with the real world. This ministry, this pastor approaches ministry from the perspective of the real world. And I know there are people, we actually lost some followers on YouTube in the last couple of weeks. Uh, just a couple, and they've been replaced since then. But, you know, it, it's people, they don't want the pastor to talk about things like preventing venereal disease and things like this. No, because after all, we're just supposed to talk about this one thing one way. Well, that's all well and good, but it's not practical. So when I say that our study is a practical biblical guide, I mean exactly what I'm saying. It is practical. We're approaching things from a perspective so that hopefully not only the believer benefits, but even the unbeliever might be helped. Because not everybody comes into the church as living for God. Not everybody. You know, I, we used to have, when I was a kid growing up in church, we used to have some real stalwart families. You know, we had families in the church that were... Uh, they were pillars of the church. And yet, they had offspring who were wild hares. You know, Lisa, they were out there doing all kind of things and involved in, you know. Well, the way I grew up in church, when they come to church, the only people being talked to were mom and dad. Yeah. They were never addressed because what's going on in their life, the church is ignoring. The church is acting like that's not even a reality. And I'm sure there are a lot of people out there that just think I'm crazy as a loon. That's okay. But I approach Bible study and teaching. I try to approach it from as practical a perspective as we can. Because I would rather a young person live to see another day. And they may eventually outgrow their wild hair. They may eventually outgrow that season. And I'd like to see them, Martin, live to repent and get right with God and live the way they ought to live. But in the meantime, if we just ignore the realities of what's going on in people's lives, we may, we may very well be costing people their lives. Mm -hmm. I look back at the church I grew up in, I know there were a number of young ladies. I don't want to make it sound like it was an epidemic, but we had several who wound up having babies out of wedlock. Well, that tells you, obviously, something was going on. And, uh, you know, and so people need to be addressed where they're at. 
and that's what we're trying to do. Before I move forward in our study this week, I've got to tell you, I've read some things online this week that just disturbed me so greatly. And I thought to myself, uh, the things that I'm reading are exactly why we are doing this study. The very things I'm reading, a lot of LGBT and non-LGBT people, not all of these comments that I'm going to refer to tonight, come from LGBT people particularly. Uh, they can apply to anybody. Straight, gay, cross-eyed, or blind, as I like to say. But there were a few comments that I've read this week, and I thought, you know, these folks really need the teaching that we are offering. They really need, Martin, to understand what it is over the last 10 or 11 weeks already that we have been talking about. Why are we taking so much time? Because if you covered it in three weeks and moved on, it would be forgotten. The best way for people to get things through their thick skull sometimes is to hear it in repetition. So you kind of have to, you know, wash it over them a few different times and finally it sinks in and they might get it. I read a comment by one gentleman and unfortunately, of course, he is part of the LGBT community. And he wrote a comment on his Facebook this week. And, and this really disturbs me. He said, I've got three guys in my bed this morning. So what do you think? Did I do pride right? Well, I suppose if you think that's something to be proud of. Uh -huh. Why? Why? What are you getting out of this type of activity what are you gleaning from that that you're just so proud as a peacock that you're going to get on a open social network platform and broadcast your business to the world you're so proud of yourself you want everybody to see that you just spent the weekend just cocking it up all over the place with everybody I'm telling you folks, you know, I look at stuff like this and I'm thinking, I, 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 know, I know straight men, I worked in car sales. If you ever want to meet some perverted men, go to a car dealership. I'm gonna tell you, I'm not kidding. There is something about car sales that opens up the pervert in men like you wouldn't believe. I've heard some of the nastiest, skankiest, filthiest, vilest, vulgarest junk come out of car salesmen's mouths than I've heard come out of anybody. Oh, I mean, it's terrible. Now, car sales is, you know, everybody loves to make fun of the car salesmen because they jump on you when you come through the door and they're running out to the parking lot to grab you as you get out of your car. But what you don't understand is these people are on commission. Yeah. And let me tell you, it is dog eat dog. And it is high pressure for them. They are working under extremely high pressure conditions. Especially if you've got a family to feed. Especially if you've got a mortgage to pay. So, you know, have a little compassion on them as well. Because they are uh, one of the highest rates of divorce and relationship failure is in police officers and car salesmen. Because they are extremely high pressure jobs. But there's something about that high pressure that just opens up the dirty and car salesmen, and I've heard them make comments, and I mean, I've heard salesmen brag about how many women they bagged in a weekend, you know. So, so this comment made by this gentleman, you know, don't think for a minute that that is something that is peculiar only to LGBT people. It is not. I know plenty of heterosexuals who are just as quick to brag about their exploits and to brag about, you know, what they accomplished. But the problem is we have a society of people, and thanks to the sexual revolution letting everything out of the closet, everything, the good, bad, and the ugly, 
thanks to the sexual revolution, letting everything sexual out of the closet, we have people today running around who value themselves according to their sex appeal and their ability to attract and to, you know, engage in sexual activity with other people. And they literally have come to value themselves. I'm going to tell you, that is also something that is very common for people who have been sexually abused, especially as young people. Because if you're a child and someone is molesting you or someone is, you know, taking advantage of you, uh, they're telling you that you're special and that, you know, this is a very special thing. And, you know, they, and they develop within that child's thinking the notion that sexual expression is the equivalent to being special and to feeling wanted and feeling needed. And so there are people out there who, that they're trying constantly to satisfy that hunger to feel wanted and to feel needed. And the only way they can they can even begin to to feel that is when they attract someone sexually and they're able to engage someone in something of a sexual nature but i read this young man's comment and i thought to myself dear god how sad that you know he equates this with pride what does that have to do with pride that that, that doesn't have anything but thank you because every right-wing nut who reads that comment you have just fed the fires, and you have just stoked the flames, and you have just helped them to hate us even more, and to view us even more as a bunch of pigs and perverts. Thank you for that. I appreciate that. Because most of these people don't even realize that those of us who are part of this church exist. Most people in our communities don't even know we exist. So if we don't know we exist, how in the world do we expect the non-LGBT population to understand that there are God-fearing, morality-embracing, non-hypersexual, you know, people in the LGBT communities? I came to realize when I came back to God and I came back into the church... I came to realize that, you know, one of the biggest lies that the devil tells people, and, and I say the devil because, folks, I'm going to tell you, Satan loves for people to be misinformed. Because misinformation can, can really push you in some bad directions. And one of the worst lies that Satan loves to tell, especially gay men, is that part of being gay, Martin, is being promiscuous. That's just part of being gay. If you're going to be gay, then bless God, you're going to be promiscuous. You're going to be out there, you know, bagging everything that has legs and, you know, just being as active as you want to be and spitting in the face of society and not caring about uh, moral norms or what have you or reining in your lusts. And, and I don't know how many times I've read young men write Something to the effect of, you know, well, that's just gay life. No, it's not. No, it's not. People who are in the so-called ex-gay movement, they love to sell the notion that part of the gay package is being promiscuous and being vulgar and being nasty. They love to sell that. They love to make you believe that that's all a package deal and that you can't be one without the other. Well, I'm going to tell you a little secret. It is not part of the package by any stretch of the imagination. Promiscuousness is not synonymous with being LGBT. But I will tell you this. A lot of LGBT people, because they've lost their faith and they've lost their connection to God and they have set aside their moral compass, they have come to believe that they can allow their lusts to run amok. They literally just take off the governor, so to speak, 
on their lust mechanism and they allow it to run amok. Kind of goes along with that mindset, well, if I'm going to hell anyway, then bless God, I might as well go at full speed, you know? How do I know this? I'm, I'm going to be honest. I'm going to tell you. Been there, done it. When I came back to God and I came back into the church after being out for a few years, I realized, Lisa, that I could turn off my lust mechanism. I did not have to give myself permission to lust the way that I had allowed myself permission to lust before. Do you follow what I'm saying? All of a sudden, Martin, guess what I found out? I found out that it was easy as pie. It was not nearly as difficult as I thought it was. Because being gay and being, being overcome with lust or, or being promiscuous are not synonymous. They do not go together. No. When people try to sell you that lie, what they're actually selling you is misinformation based on the fact that you're allowing your own lust mechanism to run amok. You don't have a gay demon, honey. If anything, you've got a lustful spirit. But that has nothing to do with your being gay because there are people out there who are straight who have a lustful spirit. Mm -hmm. And they're running around, you know, messing with everything that has legs and, you know, doing all kinds of stuff. So there's a lot of misinformation. But I found out that when I said to myself, okay, it does not please God for you to be running around looking at everybody and just drooling and, you know, breathing heavy over everything you see and, and you know, wanting to hook up with everything you look at and all. That, that is not a lifestyle that pleases the Lord. Why? Again, I, I get up here, this is part of our practical approach. Because God is just sitting in heaven ready to condemn you to hell because you're doing this. No, that's not the reason. Moms and dads right here on planet Earth see their children making decisions and they know those decisions are self-destructive. They know those decisions, Martin, are going to lead them in a bad direction and are going to cost them down the road. That those decisions are going to hurt them. And they mourn for their children because they know, man, if that kid, you know, I've got nieces and nephews and I see the way they act and I see the way they do things. And I think to myself, oh my goodness, if they stay on that track, Lisa, oh my God, they are headed for utter destruction. They are, they're headed for failure. They're never going to accomplish anything in life. They're never going to achieve anything in life. They're never going to know what real, true love and relationship is. Why? Well... Because I'm cursing them? No, because of the decisions they're making. Well, God is the same way. God has given us wisdom in His Word. He's given us guidance through His Word. And when He sees us going off in these other directions, He knows that is going to end in your destruction. You know, here you've got somebody who wants more than anything in this world to be loved and to love, but the way they're doing things, they're never going to get there. And you've got to sit back as God and watch it happen. And you're looking at your children and you're watching them. They're out there just sleeping around. One man, an acquaintance of mine on Facebook, wrote of an acquaintance of his. And he said that this acquaintance of his made a comment on his Facebook profile that he found it very difficult to approach people and to talk to people that he might be interested in. And we talked about that some weeks back, right? And yet, my Facebook friend said, and yet, this same person is constantly talking about all his sexual exploits. So my Facebook friend said, how do you do that? He said, I asked him, how do you do that? How can you be afraid to talk to people that you're interested in, and yet every time I turn around, you're writing about having another fling with somebody else? How does that work? He said, you're too afraid to talk to a stranger, but you'll open your legs and lay down on the bed for everybody that walks along. Hello now. Mm -hmm. 
Does anybody not see where there's a problem with this? Does anybody not see where this could be a problem? You're afraid to talk to somebody, but you're sure not afraid to have sex with them. That's the very person who's going to wind up dead one day, who's going to be stuffed in a dumpster behind a storefront somewhere because they're so ready to get involved sexually, and yet they cannot find the nerve to communicate and talk to people. So you don't know what that person is. You don't even have a clue. You hadn't even opened yourself up to try to figure out anything about them before you're laying down with them. But this is a problem we have in our society today. People are afraid to communicate. People don't understand that road to matrimony that I talked about, dating, courting, uh, becoming engaged, and, you know, and then eventually marrying and all that. They don't understand that road to matrimony, and they are in high speed, Martin, from the minute they meet somebody. To, it's like they are going so fast and moving so fast that it is beyond dangerous. We're not talking about driving 90 miles an hour on a highway. We're talking about driving 290 miles an hour on a crowded highway. You're going to wind up in a wreck. I read about one person online who was saying how dis depressed and despondent he is. And he wrote and said, this is the last year that I'm going to be single. <laughs> and I thought to myself, Did I not talk a few weeks ago about how desperation is one of your biggest enemies? You want to make bad choices? You want to make bad decisions? Just approach things from a desperate perspective. And I know because, again, been there, done it. Folks, listen, I'm not... This is not Mr. Perfect standing here telling you I did it all right. You know, my whole life I've done everything right. No, as a matter of fact, I've been down most of these roads. That's why I'm trying to tell you they don't work. Desperation is the worst place in the world that you could be operating from when it comes to finding true and lasting love and genuine commitment. If you are desperate for somebody, you will grasp at straws. I wrote a poem years ago that talks about, and I'm trying to remember if I, if I could, uh, I'm terrible about I, quoting my own poetry. I actually have to read it because I literally half the time can't remember my own poetry. But anyway, it talks about uh, how in my own life experience, you know, I kept grasping things and holding on to things so tightly that my fist and my knuckles would become white. You know, when you hold something so tight, your knuckles turn white. And then ultimately, I would discover that what I was holding on to was something I should never have touched to start with. It was something that wasn't good for me from the get-go. But I was at a place in my life where I was so desperate for love. I wanted so desperately for somebody to be able to love me. And I'm telling you, the biggest part of that was a very poor self-image. It had to do with me thinking and feeling extremely poorly about it. I didn't feel like I was lovable. I didn't feel like I was deserving of it. If I did... If I valued myself more, I wouldn't have been so desperate. I wouldn't have clung to every creep that come along and give me a good line. And then they turn around and they verbally abuse you. They psychologically abuse you. They mentally abuse you. Hello now. They're out there messing around on you every chance they get because you know what? They don't value you in the least. You don't mean anything to them. When you're with somebody you care about and you start thinking about, you know, even the, the, the fleeting thought crosses your mind about stepping out on that person. 
you can't help, but because you value them, you cannot help but think, but what would this do to them? How would that affect them? You know, how, it, you can't help but feel that way. Why? Because you value them. Another man on Facebook this week wrote and said something about, oh, I'm fed up with reading, you, you read these every day. I'm fed up with relationships. Ah, oh, they're overrated. I'm tired of it. And I'm sitting there saying to myself, no, you're not. No, you're not, you're not tired of relationships. You haven't had relationships. You're equating these high-speed romances that you've had with relationships. No, no, no. When you're in relationship with somebody, you're both working at it, honey. The problem is you've hooked yourself up to every stick and fire engine that come flying down the road, and you wound up getting tossed here, there, and everywhere, you know, being dragged down the highway, and when you're done, you're the worst for the wear, and then you're saying, boy, I didn't like that experience. That was a terrible experience. Relationships, oh, they're a terrible thing. No, relationships are not a terrible thing. You were not in a relationship. No, out of desperation, out of a poor self-image, you ran into this concoction that you ran into, the person you got involved with wasn't anywhere near as committed to you as you thought you were to them. Hello now. Well, if you'd have taken that road, if you'd have taken that path I've talked about to matrimony, if you'd have taken your time to get to know somebody before jumping in the sack with everybody, if you'd actually spent time with them and gotten to know them and all of this, you know what? You may never have entered into a relationship with them. But you just run, you know, it's, it, you have two speeds. Stop and go. That's it. You're, you know, in the minute you got some fool who's willing to say, okay, we're dating. You're my boyfriend. You're my girlfriend. All right, boom, I'm in a relationship. Oh, folks, please. Not everybody that goes to City Hall and gets a marriage license gets married. What do you mean by that, Pastor? I mean, just because you go through the motions doesn't mean that you genuinely make the commitment that marriage requires. I'm going to say this. I told you I, sometimes I'm too, I'm too transparent for my own good. My father is one of those people who should have never gotten married, ever, a day in his life. My father had no interest in marriage. My father had no interest in family, none. He liked scoring. I'm just putting it out there. If you don't like it, then change the channel. Go look at something else on YouTube. Go watch America's Funniest Home Videos, because I'm offering practical ministry here, okay? My father had no interest in marriage whatsoever. He got married to my mother and never acted like he was married from day one, Lisa. Early in my parents' marriage, my great-grandmother caught him out and about with another woman. Well, I'm going to tell you, when it comes to my great-grandma, you don't want to do that to one of her kids or grandkids because she ain't going to like you very well for the rest of your days. My father, and as I was growing up, I was always a little bit too advanced for my age, a little precocious. I knew what was going on. My mother couldn't see it. I knew. I could see it just clear as a bell. And, and it bothered me so bad Oh yeah, cheating dad, you think your kids don't know? Guess again. Think your wife don't know? Guess again. I'm going to tell you something. That lifestyle of deceit so that you can play the field while you're married, that lifestyle of deceit is taking its toll on your wife, on your husband, on your children, whether you realize it is or not. That's why God does not condone by any means adultery. 
Because once you become one flesh with somebody, all of your actions are going to have a reaction within your marriage and within your family unit. And don't you think it won't. The minute you have to start sneaking around, the minute you start having to lie and be deceitful, immediately you begin to sow into your relationship all kinds of negative things. Don't you realize what you're doing? You cannot be dishonest with your spouse and expect that your relationship somehow is going to be healthy at any level. It doesn't work that way. You're one flesh. You join yourself to that person. You have got to be able to be honest. You've got to be able to be open. You've got to be able to communicate. When you've got something going on in your life that you have to shut them down and shut them out of, then you're not able to communicate. How many of us who are part of the LGBT community, when you go to family functions or you go to visit certain family members, you cannot talk about your relationships. You cannot talk about so many topics and so many issues, right? And it's tiring. You say, boy, I'll tell you, I don't even like to go visit mom and dad because when I go to visit them, all I can really talk about is small talk because I can't talk about my marriage. I can't talk about my husband. I can't talk about my wife, my partner, my spouse. Do you know what I'm talking about? Is that not tiring? Is that not, it, having that area of your life that you have to kind of keep them shut out of and you're constantly, everything you say, you're, you're running through the computer in your mind, you know, should I say this, should I say that? I, I gotta be careful not to say this, gotta be careful not to say that. You get a cheating spouse and this is what you get. This is what happens. That's the mode they go into. So, you know, the easiest way not to avoid that is keep your activity in one bed, honey. Yep. Oh, my. Well, Pastor, I can't believe you're an LGBT-affirming pastor, and you're saying these things. Why, don't you know we're supposed to believe in sexual freedom, and we're supposed... Um, excuse me, we ain't supposed to believe nothing, honey. Just because you and I may share... And orientation does not mean that we share the same moral values. Right. Don't give me this garbage of we're supposed to believe. I love how secular LGBT culture tries to dictate to all LGBT people how we're, we're supposed to be and how we're supposed to behave and how we're supposed to believe. Baloney. Secular culture tries to do the same thing to the non-LGBT community, to the straight community. And if they have any scruples and if they have any convictions, if they have any spirituality at all, they reject what the secular culture tries to feed them. And they embrace higher values. Am I telling the truth? Well, I got news for you. There are tons and tons and tons and tons of people in the LGBT community. Go to my Facebook page. I've got almost 5,000 of them lined up as friends. And the majority of those people, honey, they do not embrace what LGBT, quote unquote, secular culture dictates ought to be how they live their lives. But I heard this fella, you know, this is the last year I'm going to be single. And I thought, dear God, desperation, lack of self-worth, trying to find value in being valued by someone else. That is a dangerous prescription. That is a dangerous position to be in. You are going to make bad choices and you are going to find yourself in bad places. Yeah. I know I've been there. I've been there, Martin. Man, I'll tell you what, I have been there. Me too. Took me a long time to finally realize, you know what, stupid, you better... See, there you go, I said Sunday, I call myself names, <laughs> there you go. There's an example. You know, but I've, I've, it finally came to the place in my life where I said, Charles, you better learn to value yourself, son. Yes. 
Now you hear people say these things and many people hear these words and they say, well, but I do value myself. No, you don't. Let me tell you something. When you can give yourself away twice a day, every day, and three, three times a day on weekends, honey, you ain't valuing yourself very much at all. When you don't expect anything out of anybody in exchange for access to your body and your mind, then you do not value yourself at all. It took me a long time to finally learn it really did. Years. When I came out in 89, I was about as naive a person as you've ever met. Literally, you wouldn't believe it to know me now, right? Say, well, Pastor, that's not a naive man. <laughs> I was as naive as they come. I really was. Immature, childish, insecure. Oh, my goodness. Every one of those adjectives described me to a T. I'd latch on to somebody, and I was like an emotional leech. I'd just drain the energy right out of them because I was so needy. I look at some of the early people I dated and how... You know, they broke up with me and broke my heart and left me so depressed and so despondent. And I realized that, Lisa, I was the one who basically drove them away because I was just way too needy. Way too needy. Way too insecure. Way too immature. No one near as developed as I thought I was. But we live in a society where people want to be valued by someone else and they want to derive a sense of value from someone else rather than deriving a sense of value from within themselves. So we live in a society where people are never taking the time to invest in themselves. Look at yourself as a product. And be honest. If you're cracked, you're cracked. If you're broken, you're broken. Come on now. Ain't nothing wrong with being broken. But you can't fix it if you don't acknowledge it's broken. Right. You can't mend it if you don't acknowledge it's cracked. Mm -hmm. If you cannot come to terms with who you are and where you're at in life, I finally came to the point where I realized, you know what? I've, here I've been jumping in and out of what I thought were relationships, right? And I finally came to the point in my life where I realized, I said, um, I'm not even ready for a relationship. I'm not. I'm not mature enough. I haven't got my stuff together enough for a relationship yet. And when I finally got to the place where I was willing to step back, look in the mirror, and be honest with what I saw, the good, bad, and the ugly. Now, you may need to go to a psychologist to, to do this, folks. I'm going to be honest. You may need to see a counselor to help you do this. A lot of this, you know, most people can't do this by themselves. But don't look at it like, well, I'm, if I go to a doctor, that means I'm sick. No. If you go to a doctor, it means you're not well. That there are things that need to be healed. There are things that need to be fixed. There are things that need to be repaired. People go to the doctor every day with broken limbs. That doesn't mean they're a defective person. It just means they got a broken arm or a broken leg and it needs to be fixed. Same thing is true of psychologists and counselors and pastors and this sort of thing. Take the time to invest in yourself and make yourself ready. So that when you finally begin to value yourself, all of a sudden, you know what? Being single ain't going to bother you no way. Being single, it's not that big a deal. It took me a long time to get there. <laughs> I'm 52. I'll be 53 in September. It took me a long time, Martin, to get to the place where I could just handle the fact that, you know what, I'm, I'm single, that's all right. That's all well and good. I'd rather be happy single than miserable with somebody because, believe me, I was miserable with plenty of people. 
There is nothing worse in the world than thinking you have somebody in your life that's supposed to love and care about you and having them not. Right. And the very things you're looking to them for, they're not giving you. There is nothing that feels worse than being with somebody and still feeling lonely. Anybody ever been in that position? Yeah. You got somebody right next to you and you still feel like you're alone in the world. You've got to learn to value yourself. We've been talking about marriage. Last week we began talking about marriage. All of the principles of Scripture are presented in terms of husbands and wives. I've said it before, I'll say it again. Scripture presents things oftentimes in terms of ideals. However, does that mean that that principle is only applicable to this specific gender equation? No, not at all. All of the principles in the Word of God that are related to marriage, all of the principles in the Word of God that speak to uh, husbands and wives, if you remember that the initial purpose in God creating Eve for Adam was two things. Do you remember what we talked about? What those two things were? God looked and said, it is not good that man should be alone. So his first purpose was companionship. Doesn't take gender to be a companion. You don't have to be a female to be a companion to a male. You don't have to be a male to be a companion to a female. Am I telling the truth? No. And then he said, it is not good that man should be alone. Number one is companionship. Number two is I will make a helpmate for him. A helper. I've got news for you. God created Eve for Adam, and the purpose that God created Eve for Adam had nothing in the universe to do with gender. Gender was not necessary to that initial equation. Do you understand what I'm saying? So if you understand that, if you understand companionship and help can come from anybody, then when you read passages in the Word of God that talk about husbands and wives, then these principles apply to any relationship. They, they apply to any relation. It doesn't matter what gender is involved. For instance, in 1 Corinthians 7 and 2, the Word of God said, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it, with the washing of water by the word. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. What is, what is the writer saying? What is Paul saying to the church at Corinth? He's saying if you're in a relationship, if you're married, then you need to love that other person to the extent that you would lay down your life on their behalf. If you can get married and you do not feel that way about the other person, you're not ready for marriage. If you have not come to the place where you love and you value that other human being more than your own life, you have no business getting married. See, this is the problem. We got people that go into marriage every day and, and oh, I love them to death, but boy, I'll tell you what, let somebody pull out a gun and I'll push him in front of the guy with the gun. <laughs> and then I'll go find me somebody else to marry, you know, after I bury this one, you know. No. Greater love hath no man than this, than a man lay down his life for his friends. I got news for you. You can call gay relationships, you can call LGBT relationships dirty and foul and nasty and ugly all you want to. But when those two people love each other enough, 
that they would give their lives for one another. There is nothing ugly. There is nothing dirty about that. According to my Bible, there is no greater love that exists between anybody than that. Do you follow what I'm saying? That's the truth. You, that may be an inconvenient truth. That may be a truth a lot of people don't feel comfortable facing up to. I remember living in Brooklyn years ago. Brooklyn, New York. And there was a terrible story about a, a fire in a brownstone in Brooklyn. And this elderly man had gone to his neighbor's house. He smelled gas and what have you. And warned them they needed to get out of the house. Well, don't you know about the time he was trying to get out of the house himself, it blew. He died. TV reporters came. They interviewed his quote-unquote long-time roommate. They had been roommates for 50 years. You know, this is back before you could say things any differently, you know. So this is how they worded it. These men had been companions and had shared a home for 50 years. And they interviewed the surviving gentleman, an elderly man. He wept uncontrollably and said, I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know how I can live without him on television. I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know how I can live without him. I don't know how I can live without him. But we have dingalinks in our world who want to call that nasty. They want to call that dirty. They want to call that unclean. They want to call that sinful. Listen, when you got two men who are living together for 50 years and they have become so reliant upon one another and they count on one another that when one of them dies, the other one literally just sobbed. If you saw Richard Nixon at his wife's funeral, if ever I saw a man mourning a woman he loved, it was Richard Nixon when his wife Pat died. I felt so bad for him, bless his heart. He stood by her coffin and wept and shook. His body just shook. You could see the, the, the grief that he was trying to bear up under. I saw that same grief in this man. Well, they were together as long as Richard Nixon and Pat were. Oh, but Pat and Richard, well, that's a relationship to celebrate. These men, they were perverts. They were pigs. They, you're stupid. You're foolish. You're foolish. Now, any principle you read in Scripture related to marriage and relationships, it applies to any gender. The gender is not important to the equation. Okay? If it's not speaking to the issue of procreation, then, it, then gender is not an issue because that is the only time gender becomes important to the equation. Am I telling the truth? Yeah. In Ephesians, uh, sorry, let me see. Let me go down here. Genesis chapter no <laughs> oh I see I gave you the wrong reference a moment ago it was not 1 Corinthians 7 and 2 it was Ephesians 5 20, uh, 5 and 26 the, the reference is beneath the scripture not above it apparently alright in Deuteronomy 24 and 5 the word of God said when a man taketh a new wife he shall not go out to war. Neither shall he be charged with any business. But he shall be free at home one year. And shall cheer up his wife which he hath taken. This was part of the national law for the nation of Israel. Imagine this. Oh, we live in a country today. We've got people that... Bless God, they have a fit over the idea of giving a woman time off from work for having a baby. 
No, we don't want to give maternity leave. We don't want to, you know, do that. No. I love these people who want to embrace the law of Moses in certain areas. You know, we want to kill the queers, but you know, everything else we're going to ignore. Um, excuse me, if you want to embrace the law of Moses, if you want America to do what the law of Moses taught the nation of Israel to do, then here's the policy you need to embrace. If a man gets married, you cannot put him in the army for a year. He cannot serve in the army for one year. Nor can he be engaged in any business for one year. You know why people used to give wedding gifts? You know why they used to you know what you know where the whole idea of wedding gifts comes from? To make your life as carefree and as easy for the first year as they possibly could. Because God wants a newly married couple to devote their first year entirely to their relationship. How do you like that? God wants the average honeymoon to last at least one year. Go out and travel. Go out and have a good time. Get to know one another. Enjoy some experiences. Do some things together. Boy, I want to tell you, can you imagine how much stronger marriages in our country would be if... For the first year, every couple were able to do this. Can you imagine? Tommy and I, in the almost 17 years we've been together, we've been able to take a number of cruises. We've been able to go on some trips and do some things. And those experiences are wonderful. And they're, they're incredible things to be able to share with somebody. Imagine starting your marriage out with a whole year of that. Boy, I'm going to tell you, you want to talk about helping that plant to make some roots. When I transplanted some flowers at the house, when I went to Lowe's and bought some rose bushes and brought them to the house and planted them, you know, they say in the instructions, for the first six months to a year, you need to water these things constantly. You constantly need to water them for the first six months to a year. And they said, you know, be diligent to water them very, very frequently. After that year, you won't have to do it nearly as often. But in order to help that plant get established, in order to help it take root, you need to really water it well for the first year. Here we've got God saying that marriages need to start out in this way. The first year, they need to be able to devote entirely and completely to one another. Isn't that amazing? But we got people, they're going to work two days after their wedding. They're so involved, they're spending all their time, and then we wonder why before too long their marriage is running into trouble. Well, he, he never gave it enough time for the thing to get any roots to start with. Genesis chapter 2, verses 22 through 24. Listen to this. This is important. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she has different body parts. Oh, wait, no. Let me read this. I, I read it wrong. Because she was taken out of man. She was not called woman because of gender. Hello now. She was not called woman because she had this rather than that. I'm being real nice tonight. Do you follow what I'm saying? No, she was called woman because she was taken out of man. Man. My goodness. When you understand this, it sure does change perspective a little bit, doesn't it? We've got people who have made everything an issue of gender. Man, penis, woman, vagina. Sorry. That's, that, no, that's not it. 
She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. You become one singular unit in the eyes and sight of God. You become one flesh. Everything you do in the flesh affects your spouse as well. That's why I said if you're out there flighting around, doing all kinds of business, and you wind up with some horrible, terrible disease, you can bring that home to your spouse. And your spouse doesn't deserve it. They weren't out there doing all that foolishness. You're one flesh. Once you come together with somebody and you become one flesh, everything you do has repercussions not only for you, but also for your spouse. What is wrong with people that they can get married and not appreciate the, the fact that their choices and their decisions and their behavior will have an impact on their spouse as well? What's wrong with it? Because they're still living single, Martin. Right. That's the problem. They're like my dad. They've still got that mindset, I'm out here on my own, I'm doing my own thing. They hadn't, they hadn't figured out yet what marriage and relationships are truly all about. All right, marriage was designed to serve humanity as a model of our relationship with God. Marriage was designed, I'm going to repeat that so you'll understand. Marriage was designed to serve as a model of our relationship with God. See, there's an, an important reason that there would be a distinction between woman and man. Because woman came out of man, she was not man. We are born of God, we are not gods. Hello now. Now the Mormon church will tell you different. The Bible does not tell us different. There's a reason why we have this male-female model, folks. There is a reason why, even though a lot of people in affirming churches have gone with this, what, honestly, what I consider to be asinine, gender-neutral language and all this foolishness, there is a reason why that gender language exists. There is a reason why we have this male-female uh, presentation of human relationships. Why? Because it serves as a model of our relationship to God. Why are women spoken of as the weaker sex? Because as God's children, we are the weaker. As God's spouse, we are the weaker. As the bride of Christ, we are the weaker. As the bride of Christ, we are reliant upon Him. Do you follow what I'm saying? That's why we have marriage represented in a specific fashion. That is why we have gender roles defined in certain ways and presented in certain ways. It does not mean that this is a universal principle and this is a fact across the board. All women are weaker than men. All women can't do what a man can do. Oh, baloney. I know plenty of women that can do everything a man can do and more. All right? We're not saying that isn't so. But there's a reason. You know, there are people in affirming churches who get upset that the Bible presents, you know, male and female in this way. Oh, it's sexist. It's a... No, it's not. It is a model of our relationship with God. Husbands, love your wives. How? Even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. So the relationship between husband and wife is presented in Scripture in, in an in a idyllic fashion for the purpose of serving as a model of our relationship with God. So when you see women portrayed in a certain fashion, don't get all, you know, don't get your hair up in a knot and don't have a, a stroke understand 
that that is God trying to help you understand the role and the position of the church. You remember, I told you, you know, one of the things about the Word of God I love, it just makes one enormous circle. One great big circle. It comes back around and touches again. You remember we did our study about who is that woman? Remember we talked about the fact that at one point she said, uh, I sit as a queen and am no widow. She usurped her husband. Her husband's still living, but she's sitting and she's reigning as the queen. Well, again, that is using the gender roles, you know, and to help identify the relationship between God and his church. No, he's the king. The church is the queen. We have no business usurping him and trying to rule the earth in his stead. Hello now. That's not our job. We've got Protestants in the church world today who are trying to do that very thing, just like Mother Rome. They're trying to get into a political position. They're trying to get into a social position so that they can sit and rule as the queen. No, the king's coming. He'll take care of ruling when he gets here. In the meantime, you need to submit yourself unto your own husband because the concept of husband and wife is presented as a type and as a model of our relationship with God. Are you following me? So we get all, when we read words like husbands and wives, and we get all caught up in the gender aspect of things, when the gender aspect of things is really the smallest part of the equation. If you're not talking about procreation, then the gender aspect of things really has no application. It, it, it means nothing. Because the only place where the gender application is essential and cannot be compromised, no man can just up and decide, okay, I'm going to have a baby. Boop, here I go, I'm going to have a baby, you know. No. So the only time that gender-specific uh, issues come into play is where procreation is concerned. Otherwise, we're looking at it in terms of why did God, why did God create Adam for Eve? Doesn't say one word about sex, doesn't say one word about procreation, doesn't say one word about babies. No, he said, I don't like the fact that Adam is alone. He needs a helper. I'm going to give him a companion, and I'm going to give him a helper. When we find that perfect mate in our life, when we find that perfect spouse, we should be looking for a companion and a helper. And if they're not helping you, then you don't need them. And if they're not providing companionship for you, you don't need them. How many people you and I know, I'm closing right now tonight, how many people you and I know are in relationships and yet their spouse is always off running about doing this, that, and the other thing and they don't have the companionship. Well, that's part of the whole reason you got married to begin with. You know, they say when military... Uh, People in the military serve that their family serves with them, you know. And yeah, you leave the wife home all alone, she don't have a helper. She has to do everything by herself. You see why God said for the first year, I don't want men serving in the military when they get married. You see why? Because he doesn't want her to be without that helper for the whole first year because a lot of times those marriages will fail within the first year or two for that very reason. They don't have their companion. They don't have their helper. Yeah. Amen. I don't know about you, but I appreciate the wisdom of the Word of God. I appreciate the fact, you know, people talk about, you know, they feel like that the, the Scriptures are so impractical and so, you know, uh, oh, it just isn't practical. It's, it's ridiculous. You know, God approved of slavery. No, he didn't. You don't know your Bible. If you think God approved of slavery, no, he acknowledged slavery. He did not approve of slavery. He even made special provisions within the law so that on the 50th year, the year of Jubilee, that all slaves would go free. Every 50 years, 
all slaves were set free according to the law of Moses. So you, you need to understand your Bible a little bit better. There's a lot of things that existed in the world that the writers in Scripture wrote about Martin. They did not write about it because they approved of those things, but they acknowledged that this was a reality in the world in which we live. It's just like my teaching. There are things there. Sometimes I talk about things, and there are people out there who say, Oh, he's approving of them. No, I am not. No, I'm not approving of them. But I'm acknowledging that they exist. I'm not ignoring the fact that these realities exist. You follow what I'm saying? Amen. Can you stand with me this evening?